All right, everyone, as always, I have a great interview for you in this episode. I am going to be chatting with Scott Knowles. Scott's from South Georgia and started doing obstacle course racing in 2015. Since then, he's done 165 Spartan races. In fact, he loves Spartan races so much. In 2017, he started a podcast called I Am a Spartan Podcast that he does for fun outside of his regular work, which is a great podcast, and I highly recommend you guys checking it out if you haven't listened in yet. Scott, thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, thanks for having me, man. And I just want to say you have a well better voice for podcasting than I do. <laughs> I don't know about that. I don't know. I, sometimes I feel it's it's kind of boring, and you got that Southern, that Southern accent. So I married a girl from Mississippi, so... Oh yeah, um, yeah. It's it's always fun to hear the southern southern twang. But I always thought, you know, every time I listen to your podcast, I was like, man, this guy sounds so per professional. He's got such a monotone voice. You know, it never gets really excited, <laughs> and it never gets, you know, lower than it should. I mean, you you just got a great voice for it. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, but you know what I I love about you? At least I I remember when we when we chatted last time. Uh, for your podcast, uh, I don't think you edit. You just you just do it. You get it done. And I sit here and I stress and I start over and I re-record. And you just you just power through and you just get the job done. So, yeah, and it, it and that equals like bad sound quality. I, you know, I'm notorious for having a lot of background noise. You know, like that white noise in the background. But here recently, I started kind of playing around with Audacity and trying to kind of take some of that background noise out and trying to like level out the volume issues in it just to kind of tighten it up a little bit better. But you know, it, I, it, it's hard for me because I have to learn all this stuff and I'm not the most computer savvy person when it comes to that. But I, I caught on to some of it pretty quick, but uh, I still haven't started recording like the Zoom style meetings like we're doing here. And that's something that I'm, I'm trying to work towards as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I've, I, I'm the same way. I've, I self-taught all this stuff and I have a long way to go. And, um, you know, if I just spend a little bit more time, I bet I could clean up that audio stuff. And um, but as long as we get the message out, that's all that matters. Right. So that's the um, way I feel, too. Yeah, exactly. So uh I'm super excited to, to chat with you and I, I figured let's start for maybe those that that haven't listened into your podcast yet um what what got you started with obstacle course racing back in the day um so i work at i mean i was already like working out all the time and like running just local 5ks you know just for fun you know and i, and I enjoyed you know running 5ks competitively you know trying to place in my age group then too but I, I, you know i work at a hospital and um I'm kind of work maintenance over like a building offsite. It's like a three-story building. And uh, a couple of guys in there were like, hey, we're going to go do the Spartan race. And I uh, want to know if you want to do it. We'll kind of run it together as a team. And I was aware of Tough Mudder and Spartan race at the time. But the thought of going out and like trashing some good running shoes, you know, just was like, man, that's just an added expense, you know, you might not be able to use them again after you're running them like that and running with your feet wet, you know, because I was already kind of having like IT band issues and I'm figuring if you're running wet shoes and getting off camber and a lot of these situations, you know, it, it's just not healthy for a runner. But anyway, long story short, you know, there was about five of us and we all kind of started training and watching the videos for it. And our first race was in Conyers or the Atlanta Spartan in 2015 and man it was cold it was like 30 degrees and i think we ran on sunday and it was like the same day as they had the spartan cruise and we were like man we should have went and did the spartan cruise instead you know it would have been a lot warmer and but you know we ended up doing it and i was thinking you know this is probably just going to be a one and done thing for me but man when i finished that race i was just you know the adrenaline rush from finishing something like that and you know i was expecting it to be like these clean cut trails you were running on and it wasn't that it was these bushwhack running trails you know where it, it was adventure you know it was adventurous to run these trails and i guess that's what my best way to explain it is when you come out of class at recess and you're running on to get to the you know, the swings on the playground, you get that feeling again, like you did when you were a kid and I'm addicted to it. And uh, 
like I said, I mean, at the time I was only running five Ks and I was happy with that because, you know, I was having problems with my IT bands all the time. And so I was thinking, well, man, I won't never be able to do like, you know, a beast distance. That's just too much. My knees will never be able to take it. And, you know, I think like after we did that race in March at Conyers, we ended up doing like a, a three times trifecta that year because just me and all my buddies just got so hooked to it. It's it's so funny when because you know I have a kind of similar story and, I, and actually a lot of people I talk to when you when you find out their first race it's never like I'm super pumped about this thing and and I'm gonna like love it it's always like I don't know this sounds kind of silly I'm gonna hurt myself I don't really want to do it so I feel like it's it's funny when you talk to people who've never done it you get those looks of like what it doesn't even sound fun why why are you doing this but the only way you can really explain it is like, just do it, right? Just try it. And you're, you're going to see because it, it, yeah, I get it. When, when you hear us talk about it, it doesn't sound great, but it's just so funny that once you go and do it, it's like, yep, it got me. Can't wait to do the next one now. Yeah, absolutely. And it's amazing how, like, once you do a few of these races or, you know, you do a tough mud or, you know, and you do all those obstacles that are like really tough you you realize that the stuff you deal with on your day-to-day aren't that tough you know like i was when i worked at the hospital all the time you know i was just riding the elevator all the time now i i use the stairs you know i mean it's not that hard to go up a few flights of stairs you know multiple times a day you know and it's better for you and parking farther away from the building you know i mean it's it's not that big of a deal and you're just you know adding more health to your your lifestyle you know, it's just all the things that come up in your life that seem like they would be a big deal to other people that probably don't race. They seem simpler to us that, that do. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm curious, you know, you have the podcast now. What what brought you to starting starting that up? Well, I think I went, I was on my way to the last Wintergreen um, Spartan race. And we didn't know it at the time, but I was glad I was able to do that venue one time before they quit going there. But, and I was just, I come across Obstacle Dominator, you know, the one with Ben Greenfield and Hunter McIntyre when they did it back in the day. And, you know, I started listening to it, not knowing a lot about who these people were. And, um, you know, I just learned the athletes and man, I think the whole way to, uh, Wintergreen and the whole way back, I just listened to podcasts the whole time. And I was amazed at how, you know, instead of listening to music, if you listen to podcasts, it just makes the time go by so much quicker when you're on a long drive. And I think I discovered uh, Heather's and uh, I forget her ex-husband's, but the Overcome and Run podcast, I Mm -hmm. discovered theirs on the way back and started listening to theirs as well. And then I found yours right after that. Yeah, so you just uh, want to get kind of your message out or just uh, talk to people, a little bit of everything? Well, and, and you know, this is totally like not my thing to put myself out there. And I hate the way my voice sounds, you know. And a lot of people say, oh, I like, I like it. I yeah. hate the way it sounds. I mean, I, I hate country music and I sound like somebody that would dig country music and I can't stand <laughs> it. But, and, and so I like, well, and I listen to some of the podcasts and when people will do like the on-site interviews and stuff like that, where their sound quality isn't that great. And I was thinking, well, maybe I can just do one kind of, you know, low tech and maybe it won't sound that bad, you know? And at Mm -hmm. first I, I couldn't really figure it out. And I came across this app that was called, I think it was called my opinion or something podcast. And it was like a, a, a really easy way to, to more or less start a podcast and you could upload your own art to it and everything. And I don't, I think within that first year, they like emailed you and said, Hey, we're fixing to bring this podcast uh, hosting because they were hosting it too. And they were bringing that down. And so then I had to move all my stuff to another podcast. And I took like probably two months off trying to figure all that out. Cause I'm trying to also do it free. Cause I didn't, I didn't have a lot of money at the time. So I didn't want to invest a lot into it. Cause I didn't know yeah, how long yeah. I was going to do it, you know? And yeah. so, but yeah, at first my goal was like, well, I'm just going to try to interview somebody that goes to the different races, you know, and just talk to them and interview them on how their race went. And then it kind of evolved into, 
I would just see people on Facebook and they would do something and it would inspire me. And then I started reaching out to elites and stuff like that, you know, but it was something that I would have never thought that I would have started and, and got into, but I was, I liked listening to podcasts so much. I was like, well, maybe there's not a lot of this out there. So I figured mm-hmm. maybe I can add to it, you know? Awesome. Awesome. I mean, you're doing a great job. So it's, it's, well, it's great stuff. Great interviews. So oh, always good stuff on there. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about your training. Um, so obviously you've done a ton of races over the years. So a couple questions on your training. Number one, uh, what do you, do you do anything in particular? Like, or let me ask this first. Do you, suffer from you know you mentioned it band you have those chronic injuries that come up um do you feel like you keep yourself pretty pretty healthy and you don't have many issues i know i, I saw your, your recent posts and um you know fayetteville we could talk about that a little bit too and that's kind of a you know one of those things that can just happen um but kind of what do you do just to, to take care of your body to to be durable enough to do all this stuff that you want to do we start there well, I, at first, I think what I did wrong was, is, you know, everybody says when you start running and I probably, you know, I've always skateboarded my whole life, but I started getting back into running probably around probably 20, 2008, maybe. And I should have done a couch to 5k program and they were even doing one at my hospital, but I was like, no, nah, I'll just do it on my own. I don't want to go up there and have to do it on their time. I can just do it. on my own. Mm-hmm. And I, I didn't research it at all. And I just like, well, I'm just going to go out and run. And so like the first day I ran like a half a mile and the next day I ran one mile and just, you know, just did too much too soon and just wrecked my knees right off the bat and tried to like use braces to get through it and was running through pain. And I was like, this, it just didn't work. And I I finally got like a little tibia fracture just from Mm -hmm. overuse. And, um, I pretty much had to take, like, they said, you'll be fine in eight weeks and you can start back running. And that wasn't the case. And it took a while before I could actually start back running and I've lost all my speed and fitness. You know, I was bike riding, but you just, I didn't get that. I wasn't bike riding enough to suffice for the running that I was doing. And, um, so about that time, you know, I went through a divorce and I started working out and lifting weights. And I think when I started doing that, I got more strength in, in my legs and my knees. And that kind of helped the IT band syndrome kind of go away. And over the years, I've slowly but surely kind of ramped up my mileage very, very slowly. And um, it's kind of just helped with, you know, not getting injured, you know, and I've I've done some yoga and need to do more probably. And, um, you know, I try to do a lot of stuff that pertains to races. Um, I try to run sketchy trails that prepare you for the races, you know, and there's, um, I mean, even in training, I have a lot of close calls with rolling ankles or tripping, but I mean, the best way to prepare for it is to do more of it. And, you know, and that goes for these mountain races. I live in the flatland. So, you know, before I got an incline trainer that I found on marketplace, I mean, I was, I had a $10 a month, you know, membership at planet fitness. And I was just, hammering on their stair climber, you know, and when I could get to some trails, I would try to find some trails that I could run downhill too to get that same kind of, you know, feeling and training for going downhill because it's not all about going up. There's a lot about going down, especially in Spartan, because if you're not running downhill on technical terrain, you're missing a key part of what's going to be at some of the tougher races. Yeah, a hundred percent. And, um, and, but that's probably where a lot of people suffer some of those injuries, right? And they're just beating themselves up because they're not ready for that, that kind of stuff. And Absolutely. I think actually you, you said a, a couple really important things there. And actually I, in this episode, I'm, I talk about exposing yourself to uh, different positions and, and with your training, because in a race, you you don't always know, like, what's going to happen, right? How your foot's going to land and all these different things. And, you know, obviously you can't plan for anything, but I think a lot of our training and like strength training, like you said, um, so many people are caught up on the strength side. Like I need to get stronger. And and obviously that happens, 
but a lot of it, I, I try and look at it as it's going to make you more durable, right? Yeah. You're getting strong. So you're like, that's, that's the main benefit of strength training, unless you're just, you need a lot of strength when you are just, when you're lifting and, and putting yourself in these different positions, you're just becoming more durable. And that's, right. I think that's the long game, right? So that, just to kind of recap what you were saying there, I think that's all important stuff. Absolutely. And, you know, and another thing to add to that too, is, you know, practicing heavy carries, getting used to having that weight and running with it, you know, and you want to start off on like a mild terrain, of course, you know, if you're do, going to add this to your training, but that's one thing that will help you, you know, prepare for that day, you know, cause I remember I would used to would do a five, you know, do like a sprint race and just feel like I went through the worst, you know, full body workout of my life. And now that, you know, you train, you train for the race and not for just going to the gym, you know, mm -hmm. you'll prepare your body to take that beating better where, you know, you can do your super on Saturday and your sprint on Sunday, or you can do the whole trifecta in a weekend and come away not feeling too bad, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, yeah, you're totally right. Carries and rucking and, and running and getting mm -hmm. used to that. Cause it, it's so much of the race is, is kind of those, those, um, obstacles and experiences. The, the one warning I always give. So I had a client super into wanted to get a ruck, wanted to get out there and, and, and just go nuts and try to tell them, you know, just chill. Like, yeah, this is awesome. A great thing to add, but they went the first time they wore it, they decided to go on a, you know, decent hike, climbs, downhills, all this stuff. And then his knees are bugging him. And I'm like, you know, you just, it just find flat, like just like weightlifting or anything or running, right. right. Don't go right for that mile if you've never run before. So that's always my word of warning for anybody listening that is thinking about doing something like that. It's, it's awesome. And you absolutely should, but just like anything, be smart about it. Yeah. And, it, and it's, and it's like, I tell people too, all the time that are thinking about doing their first ultra they're like, and they might say, well, I only run like 10 miles a week you know, can I do an ultra? Yeah, you can do an ultra, but it's going to hurt like hell, especially on that second lap. And you're going to feel it for days after the race, maybe weeks. That's why I say, if you prepare for it, it's not going to hurt you as bad and you'll enjoy it way more. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So you brought up the ultra. That's, that's actually I, something I wanted to, to talk with you about, because I know you have a decent amount of experience uh, running and being successful at the ultras. So how many, do you know how many ultras you've done? Uh, 13 or 14. Yeah, that's awesome. And podiums a few times, right? Yes. Usually that's the distance where I will place in my age group, you know, unless something bad happens. Yeah. Well, how about we start with the bad? So walk us through... <laughs> Uh, your last race what so what happened there so man and it was so frustrating and I always ask people you know what's their favorite race and what's their least favorite race at the end of my in podcast interview mm -hmm. so after this race Fayetteville is I mean it's my least favorite race and not because it was a bad race it's because it mile nine into the race I mean I was running great uh I dropped from second to third in the age group wave because I fell my spear and Matt Cordy, he was up front and he was running really good. And so I separated from him at the spear and uh, I was running with two other guys and we had just finished the sandbag on the ultra loop and it was right around mile nine. And we come to, and a lot of the terrain on the ultra loop was very technical. A lot of down trees and branches you were kind of jumping over and stepping through. And we come across this ditch where if you went down in the ditch, it was like probably two feet deep of water and kind of sketchy, but it wasn't that long of a jump. And uh, I was right behind Ben and Ben kind of went to the right where it narrowed and got a little bit where it wasn't so far of a jump and he jumped across it. And I was like, well, that's a good idea. And, uh, and I jumped across it too. And I, I mean, I, I don't remember what the terrain looked like. I, I usually don't have to think about that, you know, cause mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a pretty good technical runner, but just that day, I just, 
I landed right, I jumped across it. It was probably like a four foot jump or something. And I landed right into an ankle roll. Mm -hmm. And my first reaction was, well, maybe I can shake it off because I've rolled my ankles before. And um, I tried to kind of, I took one step to go back into a run and I was like, no, this ain't happening. And I was like, I've sprained my ankle pretty bad. And um, I thought I was going to have to actually call for, you know, make it to the next volunteer and tell them to call them to come and get me because I couldn't get back into a run and walking was hurting really bad. And I said, well, I'm just going to walk a little bit and see if it will kind of numb out or get a little better. And I was able to kind of slowly work myself into a, a hobbling jog. And uh, I was like, well, I'm just going to go with this get back to transition and, and see how it goes, you know? And, um, I managed to keep some decent paces. You know, I figured that anytime it went like downhill and I'm talking about even like a two foot downhill into a ditch, I had to walk and very gingerly step down into anything like that because pointing my foot down was, it, it did not like it. I could go up, fine it because up felt good because it felt like it was stretching it out mm -hmm. and it at this point i think we were at the plate drag it was hurting just as bad to walk as it did to slow jog so i figured well i might i may be able to finish this race it's just going to be a lot slower than i anticipated mm -hmm. and so i come into transition and it's like well i'm going for it i'm going to finish this you know i'm, I'm i had to kind of change my mindset from competitive to survival because i just wanted to finish the race at that point and uh my buddy brett he was in there and he was about to quit too because uh he was wanting to do the ultra factor where he did the ultra went back out for a beast and then did the super and the sprint the next day and he he come into transition realized he didn't have enough time and he was just like well, screw it i'm just gonna quit you know and so mm -hmm. I called him for a few choice words and told him I was like hey man if I'm gonna finish this with a rolled ankle you can come and finish it with me mm -hmm. and so he's like all right I'll go out here with you so we ended up finishing that whole second lap together and I was able to I was able to finish it and it was tough and the one thing it just kind of frustrates me the most about it is is because it wasn't it was the fact that I had to change my mindset to survival and I had to just totally come out of competitive mode and uh, just cheer everybody on as they passed. But I was just having a good day and I knew I was having a good day and I was, I was ready to push until the end. I mean, everything was going according to plan. I felt fresh. I felt good. I was running effortless and it was just, it was sad <laughs> <laughs> when I had to do that for sure. Yeah. And I think the, my next question that I want to ask you, I think you kind of just answered it right there, but, um, so you've run a ton already. It's not like you were just trying to get your first one. Um, you've, you've finished many races before and you knew that, yeah, this, you're not going to podium at this point right now. Mm -hmm. It's just, I'm trying to finish. And I think how many people probably would have taken the easier path of just that that's it. What do I have to prove? Right. So it sounds like a, a couple things helped you. And, um, you know, you said mindset, and I think that's such an important thing, right? Where you were able to, to tell yourself that, okay, it's not, it's not about winning right now. It's, it's about having fun with the day and having a, a buddy out there and just having a little support. I mean, I think both of those things, uh, anybody can take from that, right? Where that that's, because that's a hard thing to swallow and you know, kind of do what, what I set out to do. And, you know, I think a lot of people would just say, that's it, I'm done. Yeah. And, it, and, and that's just my personality too. You know, I'm a community person and, you know, I, my goal is to go out there and just push myself and have the best race that I can have. You know, I mean, it's, it's great to, you know, get an age group podium, but that's not what it's about. You know, I go out there just to have the best race I can have and have fun with my friends, you know, if I have a buddy out there that's in my age group and they pass me, I'm cheering them on as they go by. I was like, good job, man. And anybody that's ran a race with me, if I pass you on course or you pass me, if I'm not just completely dying, you know, I always say good job or, you know, you know, way to go. 
And even in the ultras, on the, on the second loop, I talk to every single person I pass, unless it's like a huge group of people or they're already talking and I'm, I don't want to interrupt them or something like that. But I just try to talk to everybody. You know, it gets me out of the mindset of, man, this sucks, man, I'm suffering. If you talk to everybody you see, it just makes it, it makes it go by faster to me. You know, it takes everybody out of their mindset. And I think that's that's some great advice right there for anybody listening, because I think we all it's hard not to to say those mm-hmm. things to yourself. Right. When especially you're you're climbing up a hill that you just really don't want to be climbing up and you're telling yourselves how much it sucks. And I, I just don't want to do this. But I, I love that, you you know, just putting it on other people of just, hey, you're doing awesome. You know, like get, stop right. focusing internally so much, start helping others out. And all of a sudden you're probably walking faster, or maybe jogging now or. Um, you're not thinking about all the the crappy stuff going on. And I think that's a, a great mentality to have. And again, Tess, I uh, remember that uh, we raced together in uh, North Carolina and um, I wish I could say I was passing you, but I think I was pretty far behind and you caught, you know, came around a loop somewhere and, you know, cheering, cheering me on. And I think I was carrying a sandbag or something and probably was telling myself this sucks. I'm pretty far behind right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it, it helps. Yeah. If I know somebody's name, I'm like, let's go, man, pick it up. You know, I'm, I'm, I just, I just think it's fun. I want to know everybody out there. I want to be friends with everybody out there just so I can talk to them during a race, you know, or cheer them on, you know, it's just, that's, it's fun to me to do that. When you go to a race and, and you don't know anybody, it's, it's not as fun. If, mm-hmm. you know, I try to meet somebody new at, at least at every race I go to at least one person, you know, and it's not that hard to do and, everybody out there's just super friendly you know and, it, and it's just like you said when you're in an ultra b situation and you're passing somebody that's doing maybe their first beast course and you see them walking and they might be having you know the worst time of their life because they may have bitten off something more than they could chew so if you run by them and say hey man good job keep pushing you know, it might be just a little bit of motivation it takes to get them to the next obstacle or finish the yeah. race. And we, I feel like everybody needs to do that. Yeah. So if and you're I, one of those people that wants to concentrate on your race and you don't want to talk because you feel like it's going to affect your breathing when you're running during the race, don't run next to me. Or you can run next to me and I'll just talk your head off and you don't have to say anything back because I'll do that. Yeah, too. <laughs> I was just gonna, you're, you're probably the best person to run next to, right? You just you just keep going and they can focus on their breathing and, and uh, maybe just get a little um, one or two words in as you're breathing. But yeah. Um, so uh, let's let's so like I said, you've had a lot of su- success with the ultra. Um, for somebody that maybe has done one and hasn't done well, maybe they didn't finish, maybe they just want to do better or run their first one, whatever it might be, you know, what, what do you typically tell somebody that's, you know, thinking about it or didn't do well, just what, what do they need to focus on anything in particular mindset training, anything like that? Well, I'll explain it the, the same way, like when I did my first ultra, um, I remember we did, we did the Carolina Beast, I think, in 2016. And me and my buddy Michael, we were in the same hotel together. And I just remember how much of a beat down we got from doing, because this was back when it was like a, I think it was like a 16 mile, you know, beast because they weren't, you know, having standardized distances. Mm-hmm. And I remember being in the hotel room and I said, man, there's no way I can do an ultra. There's no way my body can do that. And in 2016, one one guy in our group said, well, I'm going to sign up for it. And he didn't even sign up for it. But me and two other guys in our group, we, we, we signed up for it and said, well, we're going we're gonna to do it. And it hurt like hell because I was that guy that was only running like 15 miles a week at the time. And mm-hmm. And my knees started bothering me on the first loop and they bothered me the whole second loop. And this was when in 2016, there was only, I think, three locations you could do an ultra Killington, New Jersey for the first time ever in Tahoe. And so we chose New Jersey because it was the easiest of the three. And um, 
this was the first time I'd ever hiked up mountains like that in my life. And it was, it was a, a rude awakening. So when, when I finished that race, I was, I told myself, I'm never going to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a year before I did do it again. But that next year we went to New Jersey, we knew what to expect. And in 2017, we just did back to back beasts. We did a beast on Saturday and Sunday, but we had some friends that were running the ultra. And I realized something when I was there running the beast, I was like, you know what? It, I kind of miss being out there suffering with all these people that are doing the ultra. So after that, I've done at least three ultras a year, every, every year since then, except for 2024. Yeah. yeah. And I guess what I, I like the most about the ultra is, is because it's a whole day of, doing what you love, you know, doing the obstacle course. Yeah, it sucks. Yeah, you're going to suffer, but there is a huge amount of difference between crossing the finish line and getting that buckle than crossing that finish line and getting another beast medal. It's just, it means so much more when you've gone 30 miles and jumped over that fire, you know, because you've done double the amount that you would do in a beast. And it's, I'm addicted to that feeling and I would have never thought myself in a million de- years of being a long distance runner, but I guess I am, you know, <laughs> but for somebody that's wanting to do their first one, I would say find one that's an easier one to do. And when I say easier, I say the ones that they have here in Carolina or the one that they have in Texas and I, isn't the one in slow isn't that kind of a flatter, that is pretty. That's a very runnable, runnable course. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Ultra. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you want to start off, I would start off with one of those, which was an option I didn't have. And I totally would have done that too. Mm-hmm. Um, and just slowly but surely ramp up your running volume. And it doesn't have to be a hundred percent running all the time, you know, on the weekends, like let's say you haven't worked your way up to, you know, an hour long run or a two hour long run, you know, it doesn't have to be a run. You can go and find you a good trail. You find you a trail that's got heels in it and just do you like a day hike, you know, hike for an hour, hike for a couple hours, work that time on feet up, especially if you're somebody who has like a desk job or something like that. I'm on my feet all, all day long. So I have a little bit more above, you know, people that, you know, work at desks, but you know, you got to work that time on feet, you know, and you do that along with doing the running that you're doing, you know, during the week or on the weekend, you know, it's like, let's say your long run on the weekend, maybe five miles, you know, or maybe four miles, you know, do your four miles and throw you on a little pack and then hike for another hour. You know, you're still getting stimulus. You're getting time on feet and you're getting continued time to where, you know, you're working your way closer to being in an eight hour race. Yeah. And I I think that's, that's always the big thing that people, I think they don't realize it's not just, it's this many miles. And I guess you could say that for any race, right? Even if you're going to run a sprint distance and you've never run a mile before, um, the amount of time on your feet. And if you're carrying stuff, um, that just adds up so quickly. Right. And it's, and it's a lot of people aren't going to run in an ultra. So don't be caught up on the running too much. Right. If you can, that's great. Great, great way to, to build that endurance. But I, I love what you said is just getting out there hiking and doing it for, you know, build up to it, but, you know, spending a day and get in nature and, and do your hike and, and that's all great training. And it doesn't have to be this super intense thing, but by the end of the day, you're going to be fatigued, right? It's, it's different. It's just like, you're, you know, you hiked all day. And I think a lot of those types of days are a great way to prep for it. Yeah. And I know some people that will go and try to walk a whole ultra, you know, and if if you, if you walk with a purpose Mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe take a little bit of jogging here and there, it can be done. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So what's your next ultra coming up? Do you have anything planned yet? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm signed up to do the Killington ultra. So hopefully I can have my ankle healthy by then. How's it feeling right now? It's, it's pretty sore, man. I'm, I mean, I'm walking around at work because I usually get 10,000 steps just walking around at work. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's, I'm, it's something I'm, I'm having to be on it, but it's getting better, but it, it's slow. 
it's slow. Yeah. I'm two I'm two weeks in almost now, so yeah, it's pretty yeah. slow. I was thinking it would be a little better than this by now, but what's what's hurting my feelings the most is is um, I'm not running in that. Mm-hmm. And I feel like when I get to start running again, it's going to be like starting all over again. Yeah. But I'm sure just with everything you've done, it, it may, but you're going to get it back fast. So I just have to always keep that in mind. Um, so uh, I'm curious what, like, you know, it, when you're not injured, what is a typical training week look like for you? So typically what I'll do is um, I'll try to run I usually will run anywhere from 25 to 40 miles a week. And it's kind of like something I'll do on time a lot, but I really don't train by mileage so much. I usually do it by time. Um, Mm -hmm. And the reason why is, is because I don't want to say, well, I'm going to run 15 miles on Saturday because a lot of the trails I run on, it takes a long time to run. 15 miles on the trails because they're just not clean trails. Mm -hmm. So I usually will try to do a two to three hour long run on Saturdays. And um, sometimes, you know, it'll be something where I just try to stay in zone two or zone three, or I might do a ladder in there, you know, depending on if I've done any speed work or, you know, threshold work during the week. And um, I try to at least with my incline trainer, I will try to do at least one workout a week where I'm just trying to get some gain. And it it might not be running, it might just be power hiking because you'll notice really quick when you go to these races that are super steep, you might be able to run uphill for a little while, but when it's constantly going, you're gonna be power hiking and you need mm-hmm. to have that power hiking skill down pat. I would love to say I could run all of them, but I can't. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'm right up there. I, I try and make it all up as much as I can downhill because I know my uh, uphill is uh, definitely not one of my strengths because uh, you know it's it's that power hike and um, but you know some people you you see them go for it and then those are the ones you can typically catch up to because they're just done by the time they get to the top. Yeah, and I usually we'll do like some type of weight training, you know, twice a week where I'll try to work, just do my legs and do my core and work on my grip and pull ups, you know, and there's nothing scheduled to it or nothing like that. I just Mm -hmm. go and do what I feel like doing, you know, a couple of times a week, you know, just to try to do something like that. And on a good week, I'll usually work one carry workout in there too. And I'll usually go, go to a sandbag, just because it's it's just easier to run with a sandbag than it is with a bucket. Gotcha. Absolutely. Well, I, I hope that that ankle heals quick so you can get back to all that that stuff again. Um, well, you so you mentioned your least favorite race. I have to ask, what's what's your favorite? So, um, I would probably say, and it's a love hate relationship, but that's Killington, Vermont. You know. Okay. And, the only race distance I've done there, I mean, I've done sprint on Sunday after doing the ultra there, but the only distance I've done there is the ultra. Mm-hmm. And after doing that, I don't know if I could go there and do, I mean, I'm sure I could go there and do a beast, but if I went there and did a beast when all my friends were doing the ultra, I would be like, man, I wish I would have signed up and done the ultra. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Because that's the only race and I haven't done Tahoe or, I really hadn't got out to West coast much at all, except for Texas. So I I don't know what those ultras out there have to offer, Mm -hmm. but all I know is, is Killington's cheaper for me to get to than say Mm -hmm. Utah or big bear. Yeah. But, um, it's to me, it's the race that still scares me that I won't finish. It's, Mm -hmm. it's tough. And I know a lot of people out there like, well, I'm going to sign up and do the Killington ultra and they, may have not done a mountain ultra yet or they may have just done like the carolina ultras but they really need to do tri-state first and the reason Mm -hmm. why i say that is because new jersey tri-state ultra is a great ultra to run but it's not you don't have as much climbing there you have a little bit better running terrain in some parts but 
the difference is is at Killington they have the ability to send you up more than a mile at one go and to run you down more than a mile at one shot whereas at New Jersey they may barely have enough mountain to run you up one mile at a time mm -hmm. and at New Jersey they run you through a lot of technical terrain which is great practice for Killington and they have a lot of a lot of good flat running there too but at Killington I can remember every piece of land on that mountain is flat because there's not much of it you're either going up or you're going down and besides some of the ski slopes I mean you're either it's technical mm -hmm. and a lot of the ski slopes you'll be going down pushed over grass and there's like rocks underneath it so that's why i say it, it's not just a about a climbing game you you got to be able to run downhill on sketchy terrain and there's right. some really sketchy trails in the woods at killington that they send you down and um it's, it's just a skill you got to work on and i mean my best time at killington is 10 hours and 10 minutes, I think. And that was good enough for that year. It was good enough for second place in my age group. And I was like, I don't know, 10th or 15th overall in all the age groups. So mm -hmm. if anybody out there is thinking about doing Killington and they haven't done Tri-State, just think about that. It mm -hmm. was 10 hours and that's how good it was. It's a 15 hour shutdown on the race. So yeah, it's just something to take in perspective. Yeah, and, I'm, I mean, yeah. and, and I don't, and I, and I did this in my podcast too. I'm not trying to crush anybody's feelings or say, Hey, I'm better than you. I'm not saying that. I'm just trying to tell you. And I did this with my last interview, Jonathan, because he went there and did it. And, um, but I'm just, so in a flat venue for an ultra, I'm in the six hour range at Killington. I'm in the 10 to 12 hour range. Mm -hmm. I mean, and what my, and I'm, I give you this example just to know how difficult this venue is. And it's like, I'm not trying to crush people's hopes and dreams of trying this race one day. I just say, if you haven't done New Jersey first, you should do New Jersey because it's easier and Number one, it's way more affordable to get to, like, you know, as far as travel goes. So that's why I say go do that one first. That way, you know, you can have a great idea of what a mountain ultra is like, what it's going to take to finish it, and then compare your times there to people that you know that have done Killington. And then you can kind of get an idea of, am I ready to do this race that's so hard? Because mm -hmm. I think Killington usually has a 40% finish rate. And it, yeah, a lot of it's, it's, it's brutal. A lot of it's got to do with that first cutoff transition. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I've done the, uh, so I've done Killington of uh, the Beast and, um, and did it kind of as a, I, I guess you'd say fine. Me and my wife just wanted to, we were on the East Coast and, and did it and i i mean i i remember the start line i don't remember another race where you start on a hill like leaning forward right because you're <laughs> you're on such a steep incline and then you know and it, i was joking because my wife actually started running and she took off and i'm like where are you going like let's let's <laughs> go easy out of the gate because that was even just kind of taking it easy and just having fun with the day right. man it, it's it's a brutal brutal course out there but it's gorgeous too it's awesome. so those 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 when you're out on top of the mountain and you know it was in fall the leaf changing luckily it wasn't snowing i know it can snow sometimes but um it was a beautiful course and uh but but yeah i mean that's you got to be ready to take something something like that on absolutely and, and, and the best part about running the ultra too is because it's just because when you start the race it's almost dark enough that you need a headlamp but mm -hmm. the sun usually comes up and you don't and by the time you get to the top of the first or the second climb, the sun is rising and you get to look over the whole valley and just watch that sunrise. And you're like, yeah, this is why I, I come and do this every year. I mean, 
it's it's just it's awesome and like i said being and being a flatlander and being able to go there and just have a, have a good race is just it's awesome to me you know? yeah awesome awesome and that's well, why i would say it's that's my it's a love hate relationship but that absolutely that, that's absolutely my favorite race yeah sure. awesome well, Scott, thank you so much for for uh, coming on today and and uh, chatting with me. It's been awesome and great great catching up and, and seeing you. Absolutely, man. Thanks for having me, man. Anytime. Yeah, I'll put a I'll put a link in the show notes uh, for your podcast so everybody can check that out. Um, anywhere else, people can uh, look you up, check you out, follow all the the crazy stuff you're doing. Yeah, just on Facebook and uh, Instagram. You know, I'm a Spartan podcast, and if anybody ever has any questions about you know, anything that has to do with Spartan or maybe, you know, how to, what to expect at World's Toughest Mudder or what to expect in a Spartan Ultra. I mean, just hit me up, DM me. I don't care. People do it all the time. So I'm awesome. always open awesome. to talk. Sweet. Well, thank you so much. I'll put links in there for all that so uh, people can check it out. So uh, hopefully I'll see you out at, at some point next time I'm on the East Coast, hopefully. Absolutely. Thanks, Mike.